open-hearted, full participation in the process of life that is happening, where you're fully playing and rolling your sleeves up and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're using every experience and trusting that every experience is somehow serving your growth and evolution and you're engaged in life, accepting what it is, but fully engaged in life, participating fully uh, to use every experience for your highest growth and evolution. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Something for Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashpitz. Coot, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, first, the biggest thing I want to ask you, and I think the thing that you can explain to me better than probably anyone, is the difference between acceptance and surrender. You know, acceptance is a phase in the evolution and the process of surrendering. But a lot of people confuse acceptance as surrender. Um, but it's not surrender. Uh, you know, we hear terms like, oh, accept what is. And yeah, you, yeah, you can accept what is, um, but you can still be pissed off and mad and still kind of resisting. Like, yeah, my husband is this way. I don't freaking like how he is, so I'm going to hold some of my love back. And I'll accept how he is. I'm not going to leave. But I'm still mad. And so, you know, what, what, it, it's raining outside. I don't want it to be raining outside because I, I, want, I wanted to go outside and go to the beach and get a suntan and go for a hike. And damn it, it's raining. So you can be in acceptance, but still be closed. You can be in acceptance and still be resisting. Um, so when I talk about surrender, surrender is the open-hearted, full participation in the process of life that is happening, where you're fully playing and rolling your sleeves up and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're using every experience and trusting that every experience is somehow serving your growth and evolution and you're engaged in life, accepting what it is, but fully engaged in life, participating fully uh, to use every experience for your highest growth and evolution. And I think that comes from a few things where you, when you realize that you're a soul and you're a soul that incarnates into this human experience in order to learn, to grow and evolve, you start realizing that all of life is like a university. It's a school for your soul's evolution. Every situation, every experience is part of the, the curriculum to help your soul grow and evolve. When you really understand that, you start seeing life in a different way. You start seeing every experience that happens to you, even if it's difficult, even if it's challenging, even if it's traumatic, even if it's hard, you start seeing it through a different lens, a soulful, a soul perspective. And I think when you can see it that way, it allows you to surrender. Surrender, I don't mean just lie down and sort of give up in an experience because you might be in an abusive situation. And that doesn't mean just sit there and, okay, it is what it is, continue in the relationship. It means it, it gives you the ability to accept what it is. Okay, this is what it is. And that frees you up to, rather than being a victim of the situation, rather than contracting and collapsing, saying, okay, what can I learn? How can I grow? How can I evolve? How can I use this to become more? How can I use this to fulfill my potential? I think there's the, the surrender. It's that open-hearted participation. But most people miss the phase in the middle between acceptance and surrender, there is a phase in the middle. This phase is called grieving. There is no true, authentic, full, real surrender without grieving. Because surrender is a death. Surrender is a letting go. Surrender is a releasing. Surrender is a letting go of what no longer works. It's a letting go of a phase of your life. It's a letting go of who you thought you were. So in the process of surrendering, there is a letting go. In the process of letting go, there's parts of you, an idea, a thought, an identity, a perception uh, that has to die. And so that requires a bit of grieving. Grieving when you can let go of who you were, when you can honor what was. You can honor a relationship. You can honor a phase of your life. And, and allow yourself to feel the feelings that come up so that you can let it go. Most of us, we don't allow ourselves to feel fully and we don't allow ourselves to grieve fully. So I would ask anyone listening as we talk about surrender, what have you not fully allowed yourself to grieve? Many of us, things happen, we minimize it, we just move on. 
COVID happens, we minimize it, and we just move on, not realizing that we're often carrying subtle layers of unfelt sadness or unfelt grief with us. And when we don't fully honor the grief and let go of the grief, I'm not talking about wallowing in the grief, but truly just feeling and honoring the grief, a part of our heart stays closed. A part of our heart isn't fully accessible and open. So maybe you fall in love with someone, a new relationship, but then you realize, shit, part of me has not fully grieved the end of the last one, or mm -hmm. part of me has not fully grieved the my childhood sweetheart. So then a part of your heart isn't fully open, and many times we're not fully able to surrender to the new love, surrender to the new possibility. Maybe you're someone, as a business person, you've been disappointed, COVID hit, dreams didn't happen, you felt disappointed, things didn't go according to plan, your heart closed a little bit, and then you just powered through, moved on out of survival. So now a part of your heart isn't open, so a new opportunity shows up, and, and like, you're a bit jaded. You're a bit close. You're you're a bit tight. You're you're not fully allowing yourself to feel the fullness of the excitement because it's protect. It's a protective mechanism, and so you can't surrender to to the new experience. And so for me, grieving is a key component that is the doorway to authentic surrender. And so everybody, I just ask you to sit with what have I not allowed myself to grieve. When you allow yourself to grieve, then you let go. When you let go, you you make room. When you make room, then you're open. When you're open, that's when the magic happens. So, so you so you sort of take it as like a three stepped approach. I would say your first step would be you have to accept what is, and then yeah. you potentially have to let that whatever it is die, grieve that, feel that, allow that to be part of you, and then you move into the third phase of surrender, which I think. The most important part of that, which you said, was participation. Like, yeah, the I, full I, participation. You know, look, there's a few reasons why we don't allow ourselves to grieve. Number one, simply, we or, or allow ourselves to even feel. We in our culture, I'm not a culture that's been taught how to feel. Mm. You know, when you're a little baby, like you're crying, dad says, "Shut up, be quiet, be quiet." Boys don't cry or, you know, man up, grow up. Come on, don't cry, don't cry. And so we're kind of conditioned to not feel. Maybe our parents weren't okay with their feelings. How often do you switch on the TV, right? Watch the news. Oh, you have some feelings. This is the, on the news. Oh, you have some feelings. No problem. Just feel your feelings. It will pass. No, what we're taught is, oh, you feel sad? Hey, pop a pill. You feel sad? What? Eat this thing. You feel sad? Buy this car. You feel sad? You know, watch this TV show. So we're kind of conditioned out of our feeling capacity. So that's number one. The second thing is there's a part of us as humans, we are kind of afraid to feel fully. We're afraid to feel the grief. The fear is if I let myself feel fully, then it will overwhelm me. If I let myself feel fully, it will overwhelm me. It will be too much. I won't cope. I won't manage. I won't function. Uh, and, and so we don't allow there's a sneaky reason also, sneaky, that we don't allow ourselves to feel. Sneaky as in it's survival. Um, there's this part of us that sometimes doesn't allow ourselves to feel fully because we're afraid. It's a form of denial. It's a form of, of resistance. Like uh, if my mother dies or my father dies, somebody we love dies. It's almost as though if I don't fully acknowledge the grief and feel it, maybe I can still stay connected to this person. Like, mm. if I don't acknowledge the grief, then I don't have to, have to acknowledge that they have actually died. Then I can still maybe have them inside of me, and we don't fully allow ourselves to grieve as a way of staying connected. If I don't acknowledge that my relationship with my husband or my wife is over and grieve it, then maybe I can sort of live in denial, right? And so it's a protection mechanism as to why we don't allow ourselves to feel it fully. If I don't allow myself to grieve the end of my career, then maybe I don't have to acknowledge that it's over. Maybe I don't have to acknowledge that I'm not going to be Tom Cruise, you know, and I have to grieve that phase of my life, right? I have to grieve you know, as we get older, I have to grieve that I'm not 20 anymore and maybe I'm 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 and the body changes. So grieving one's youth, right? I had a friend. She met the love of her life, an incredible man about to get married. She wanted, she was single forever, wanted to get married forever. She meets the guy. She comes up to me she's, and she says, Coot, I should be happy. I'm about to marry the love of my life. 
but I feel so sad. Mm. What's wrong with me? Like, I can't tell anyone about this. And what she didn't realize, what she wasn't allowing herself was to grieve. What she had to grieve was the end of a phase of her life, the end of her singleness, the end of her sort of perceived independence. And so as happy as she was, there was a part of her that had to die in order to sort of embrace the new life as a husband and wife, as a couple, building a life together. And so uh, there's many reasons we don't allow ourselves to be. The other one is sometimes we do this, uh, I call it a spiritual bypass, you know, um, law of attraction, right? I want to be in a high vibration. So I don't want to acknowledge the grief because that's low vibration. But mm. what we don't realize that when we don't acknowledge the grief, it doesn't go anywhere. It stays stuck and stored inside of us. And as a result, when we try to move forward and create, we just carry this energy with us and it slows us down, exhausts us, makes us tired. And when we are carrying heavy, unprocessed grief, it lowers our vibration and frequency ultimately. So we end up manifesting things that are a vibrational match to the grief that we haven't fully released. If you want to, so I will say, if you want to really raise your vibration, acknowledge your grief, feel it, feel it. All feelings remain present until fully felt and no feelings last forever. So when we can truly be with the grief fully and experience it fully, then we begin to release it. We begin to let it go. As we let it go, we get lighter. As we get lighter, our vibration rises. As we, as our vibration rises, we become more energetically magnetic to situations, experiences, and people that are vibrating at a higher frequency. So people might ask, well, how the hell do I feel? A lot of people sometimes say, Bakud, I've been feeling, I've been crying and feeling for, for years, it's decades. And it has... here's the thing. People sometimes think that they're feeling their grief, but they're not feeling it. But I've been crying. Just because you're crying doesn't mean you're feeling it. Sometimes people are thinking about their feeling, thinking about their grieving rather than fully being with it. And so to truly feel your grief requires, different from wallowing, to truly feel it, allow it, requires that you acknowledge it, you accept it, but it requires that you take the labels off of it. Don't even call it grief. And just simply experience the grief as a sensation in your body. Doesn't have, You don't even have to call it grief because that has so many connotations. Right. But just notice where, where do I feel this, this in my body? Wow. And if you can just be with the sensation. And allow yourself to just experience the sensation without judgment, without resistance, without trying to get rid of it, but just fully experience it. You might feel emotion. You will feel things in your body move. Then, then, then you are really feeling it, experiencing it. A layer peels away, and you can start to let go. And so that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. I had to. I had to learn all of this uh, as a personal experience after I, I lost my sister, Rachel, um, oh, yeah. about six years ago, wow. and sort of this exact process happened, right? If I thought that if I just denied it, yeah. that it wasn't real. And if it wasn't real, that means I could remember her forever. Because if it, yes. if it, if it became real, that means what if eight years down the line, 10 years down the line, 12 years down the line, I wasn't yeah. thinking about her anymore. Is she gone? Is she now yeah. just someone I never actually cared about? Was she even my sister? And then yeah. sort of you get overwhelmed with, with immense guilt about, you know, the fucking horrible person you were or could have been or might be. Um, but then like the most revelatory part for me was like being in a room with people who experienced the same thing but we're 10 years in the journey and I could see how they move past it in a way, not move past it, move forward with it. That's a better way to look at it, move forward with it. And some of the emotions that I had to come to terms with like shame and a sense of relief. And, you know, now I, I, I do a pretty good job of it six years later, obviously still uh, miss her every day. But point being is that you have to, at least in my experience, confront it head on. Or else yeah, it have, will you just have to go, you have to go through it. Or otherwise, else it will, yeah. Otherwise, your heart will remain closed, and then you will have to live your life in such a way so that you don't 
open up your heart again. Mm -hmm. Because opening up your heart again will cause you to feel what you're suppressing in there, which now leads to a very, very, very limited life. Like when my mother passed away in 2017, it was, which inspired my book, it was incredibly, I mean, it was devastating. You know, it was, it was, it was, she's the person I loved the most, loved me the most, um, the dearest human in my life. And it was hard, you know, but I remember when she passed away, I knew that the only way through it was through it. The only way out of it was the only way out was in to the grief and through the grief. And so what I did was I allowed myself permission and spaces. It wasn't like I just was crying all day, but I would give myself the spaces in my life in the evenings, a couple of evenings, an hour, two hours, journaling, writing, walking, just spaces to say, okay, in the next three hours, I'm just going to be with my grief and uh, see what comes up. And I remember there were moments when I just cried, man. I just, it, it was as though when I let myself feel, my heart literally shattered and broke. It just broke. But as I stayed with that, it was like something was released from me. But as I stayed with my heart breaking, it wasn't that my heart broke. It, it, it broke open. And there was more space. Mm. There was there was a deeper capacity in feeling the grief. There was a deeper capacity to feel the love that I had for my mother yes. and a deeper capacity for me to love people and life and, and, and those around me. And so your heart doesn't really break. It breaks open. But you only know that if you go through it. Have and to. there is there is a strength, and I want everyone to hear that there is a strength that comes from feeling. And even if your heart is broken, realizing your heart can never be broken, but it gets broken open. And in that process of realizing that your heart can never be broken because you experienced it and then you're still there, there's a deeper strength that arises because, like shit, I felt. I broke, I broke open, and there's more, and, and I can't be broken. So that feeling of knowing that you can't be broken, truly, your spirit can't be broken, even in the letting go, even in the grie grieving, is a deep strength that makes you unshakable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think also in that in that process of surrendering, especially when thinking about losing someone you love, I think you also learn that two emotions can exist at one time. Like I feel like I've been contending with that a lot recently because I'm getting married in September. Oh, and love it, love it, congrats. Like what a beautiful, exciting, amazing time planning this thing with my my future yeah. wife and yeah. all the, but also realizing at the same time that like my sister won't be there. And yeah. so I think that can exist mutually. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I can I can feel both of these things. And so you know, and, and, and allow here's the thing: allowing yourself to feel both of these things. If you really feel, ah, oh, my sister won't be there, will actually tenderize your heart to 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 inspire you to love even more deeply. I 100% like, agree. Like, like when, when my mother died, I realized, wow, she's not going to see my wife. She's not going to meet my children, her grandkids. My heart, I felt so much regret of the things that I didn't do. Like the only regret I had in my life was not spending more time with my mom. And it burnt me up from the inside. Not in a bad way, but of like, wow. All the things I thought was important all the things I placed value on. I was running around the world, inspiring the world, and I just didn't make time for my mom and the simple things, you know? And I say I love her the most, but I didn't make time because I just did, thought I didn't have time. And so that, that, that sacred regret, it changed me that if I didn't feel that, I don't think I would have been able to appreciate my wife. Mm. You know, and 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 the simple, ordinary moments of just hanging out with her, 
you know, it's like, oh, I've got to, it's got to do this, this amazing thing. But just now it's like, wow, what I would give to just have a cup of tea and do nothing with my mother and just waste time with my mother, I would give everything. So now when I'm just sitting around with my wife doing ordinary shit, it's the mo it's it's the most sacred time man it's the most precious time and 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 because my mother's died because of the grief because it 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 burned me from the inside i, I i'm able you know i have a son now and i'm able to really savor every moment you know with with my wife with my son because I realized that any moment it can, it can be over. Any mo any moment it can be gone. Any moment it's just we can die, right? And and so the grieving, I think, and the feeling allows us to appreciate the delicateness of life, the preciousness of what we have even more. So yes, to feel them both, you know, to really feel them both. It is interesting when I got married too. Um, it was a sur I had to surrender as well. Like I had my own grieving because after being single, there was a part of me as a man, a masculine ego, being so low. There was a part of me as a man that I had to let die. Yeah, you know, being the sort of so low, you know, global travel just by myself doing mm -hmm. the sort of, um, you know, solo cowboy sort of, you know, thing like Clint Eastwood just swinging by himself. It's just like, oh, that's a part of me that has to die so yeah. that I can embrace partnership, you know, embrace something bigger, embrace like more responsibility. Like, oh, it's not just about me anymore. And so there's there were so many parts of me that had to die that, that, that for, a, for a process period of time, I was like so blissful, like happy to be getting married, but but I had to acknowledge the part of me that was grieving, you know. And it was when when we don't acknowledge that part of us, that part of us will sabotage. That part of us will act out because that part of us needs our attention. That part of us needs our loving. That part of us needs our acknowledgement, you know. And I think this is why many times people do drugs, they drink, we drink, we do things just to sort of like numb the grief, not feel the grief, right? Not acknowledge the grief. Uh, but when we don't acknowledge the grief, we also limit the joy. And so, yeah, yeah surrender is, is, is powerful. Like people have this misconception, right, that surrender is weak, that surrender is passive, that surrender is giving up. That if you surrender and let go, you're just going to sort of be taken advantage of and, you know, be a doormat. But surrender is the most powerful thing that we can do. I believe that true surrender, letting go in the purest sense, is the real key to the next level of your life, is the real secret to manifestation, is the real password to freedom. And, and yes, surrender is a letting go of control. It is a letting go of what's no longer aligned, was no longer a vibrational match. It is a letting go of who you thought you should have been and who you think you are and who you, the life that you thought you should be living based on whatever standard you've been told. It's a letting go of that so that you can be open and available to, to, to life, you know, and life showing you, life revealing itself to you. And that's, I think, when when the real magic of life happens, you know? Yeah. I mean, if, if it also frees you up to give your best effort to the things that mean the most to you, which is yeah. not, which is not passive at all. If I'm surrendering and letting go and saying this no longer serves me or this relationship is no longer for me. Now I'm in full alignment with everything that I do based on this thing. Now I can give my best effort to that. And then yeah. I feel more joy because of it, because all this other stuff I I've let go of. And mm -hmm. so it can't be, it can't be a passive act. It's still mm -hmm. participation. It still takes effort. It still takes, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about it consistently. You don't just surrender one time and then everything is good to go for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, it's a process. But, uh, it's a process. Yes, absolutely. Um, process. And 
what did what did your what did your mom teach you about surrender that led to the book? Wow, you know, for me, for the longest time, my mom, she, her whole life was, she just was love, and I'm blessed to say that because of my mother, I know what love is, like pure, pure love, uh, and not everyone can say that, and I'm so honored to have experienced like real love, you know, and and so when my, my mother was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Um, it was devastating to hear, but but for me, it didn't. You know, it doesn't really hit you like, oh yeah, well, you know, she's gonna be fine. And then I, I was in LA, still am in LA, and she lives in London. And I started to fly back and forth from LA to London to just see her. Literally every month, I was in London for a week, flying back for back for for one year. And I would say what started off as the worst year of my life ended up becoming the best year of my life. Um, because at first I was I was hell bent on on fixing my mother and making her whole and and well, and I realized she kind of she had her own trip man she had her own journey you know and uh, it was so interesting a a about seven months into the process she was doing chemo treatments right and I would just sit with her in her chemo and hold her hand and. We would just talk, you know, about everything and nothing. And and when the doctors finally said, look, there's nothing that we can do for you. In a nice way, they say, you're going to die, so get your affairs in order. It could be days, could be weeks, could be months. Um, there's nothing we can do. There's a hard moment. Mm. And I looked my mother in the eyes. This li my mother's a little Japanese woman. And I looked her in the eyes and I said, um, two things. Are you afraid? My mother looked me in the eyes and she said, uh, no, I'm not afraid because I know I'm not this body. This body is a temporary vehicle for my soul. And I know that, yeah, well, this body will die. We will all die. But my true self, my soul, will, will, my spirit will live forever. And I will guide you from the other side. So I'm not afraid because I know who I am. And I looked into her eyes and, and she it was so clear. She knew. We can read about it, you know, but but he was someone who, in the face of her death, had peace because she knew that she was more than this body. She was a spirit, an infinite spirit that was beyond birth and beyond death. That was powerful for me to feel. And then I asked my mother, okay, because I felt like I was a bad son. <laughs> And uh, she would not say that, but I felt like I failed her, you know. And I looked my mother in the eyes. And I said, what can I do for you? Where can I take you? What can I buy you? You know, what, 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 what can we do in your final days? Because this is it, you know. And, and she had lost so much weight and her hair fell out and turned gray. I mean, it was, 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 was intense. And she looked me in the eyes and she said, you know, I said, what do you want? What do you need? She said, there's nothing that I want. There's nothing I need. She said, the only thing that I want is what God wants for my life. And it hit me, you know, and I, and I, and I saw that she was in such peace, such peace. She wasn't attached to living. She wasn't attached to dying. She was free. Mm -hmm. And that is where I saw she taught me about what surrender looks like in everyday life. Yeah, we can all surrender. We're doing yoga, right? We're in a little ceremony, uh, uh, in a seminar, uh, in, in the Machu Picchu. Yeah, I'm surrendered. But like, you're going to die. Can you surrender then? And that's what she taught me. Like, without teaching me, I saw her this entire year. She never once complained. Mm. My mother was a very emotional person. I, I realized in that moment, looking back, I didn't appreciate it in the moment, but she never once complained. She never once felt like a victim. She always had a smile on her face. We go to the chemo, she would dress up and put her makeup on and just was just living life, you know? And in a very simple way, she taught me what surrender looks like. And she was committed to, 
to the highest unfolding, to the highest good for her soul. And so for me, I think the most powerful thing that we can intend, pray, meditate on, intend, is for the highest good. What is the highest good? When we ask for the highest good to unfold in a situation, when we intend the highest good to unfold in a situation, when we pray and meditate for the highest good to unfold, we bring ourselves into an unlimited dimension of life and we open ourselves to the infinite possibilities of life to manifest. That's when surrender happens. You see, to me, the, 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 the old paradigm, right? We're taught in self-help, personal growth. Know what you want. Get clear on what you want. Write it down. Set the goals. Get, get hyper clear. Look, I'm not saying it's not cool. It's not helpful. Yeah, there's a place for it. No problem, right? Um, but what we have to realize is this is an ego-based model for living and creating life. And what we have to realize is you can have a good life this way, but it will be a limited life, not a great life. Whatever you create from the lens of the limitation of the ego will always be limited because the ego is limited to the conditioned ideas and stories of the past. The ego can't see the entire picture. The ego is not infinite. So when we create from the ego, I want this, I want that, the car, the house, what I found is you might get everything that you thought you wanted. You might. But often you will get to the point where you, you achieve what you thought you wanted only to realize that what you thought you wanted was just what you thought you wanted based on who you thought you were, mm. right? Because many times our goals can be projections of unmet needs. Like, oh, daddy wasn't around. I didn't get love and validation. So I'm going to get that six pack. I'm going to make a billion dollars. I'm going to get that Ferrari and look, I'm going to be worthy, right? And so many times our goals can be projections of unmet needs. Yeah. And, and so for me, the question is not, what do I want? Limited I, ego I. The question that I invite people to ask is a different question. And that question is, what is it that life is seeking to express through me? What is the deepest impulse that life is seeking to express? What is life seeking to manifest? What is life seeking to create? What is life seeking to speak and write and podcast? And what is life seeking to manifest through me? Because when we can open ourselves to that dimension of life, we expand. Now we're available. Now we're open. And when we can open ourselves, then we can feel and catch the vision, the deep impulse and vision for what life is seeking to manifest. Then we can move ourselves into alignment with that. Like, oh, this is the vision. This is what's true. Maybe your mind thinks it should be something else, but no, no, this is what's true. Then you can commit to that, go into action, give 100%. So I just want to be clear that surrender doesn't mean, oh, just sit there and do nothing. No, when you catch the vision that is authentically seeking to emerge, then you go into alignment and action. Then you can goal set and plan and strategize and do your marketing and you know visioning and strategy. Then you go into action and you give 100% without being attached to the outcome, without being attached, so attached to the, to, to the result. Because sometimes when we get so attached to the goal, we end up limiting life. We end up strangling life. We're not available and open. We're not surrendered. We just want what we want and we want it now. And how many times have we tried to like make something that isn't be something that is? We we, we love someone and we try to make them into our soulmate. And so mm. I tell people that when, when, you, when you pursue a goal, sometimes the goal is not the goal. Sometimes the goal is the evolutionary carrot that takes you in a journey and on a direction. And that journey is what causes you to grow and evolve and learn and become more. And that journey prepares you for the true vision and mission that life has in store for you. But you're not able to see it from your current ego's perspective because we're conditioned with fears and pain and insecurities and wants and needs and, and often we're not clear. And so I think the real key is in that surrender. It's like, what is, what is it that life is seeking to express through me? That's the, to me, that's the highest good. And, and in seeing and observing my mother and how she lived, to be honest, it wasn't just in that year. 
when I really look back on her life, her entire life was living this way. I just couldn't see it, you know. The the way she, it's a whole nother story, but the way she and my father met and she agreed to marry my father, having never met my father, having never spoken to my father, just surrendering. It's like, wow, this woman has been living surrender in front of me for decades. I just didn't see it. Yeah. And not speaking the same language as your father either, I think is yeah. one of the amazing things I heard when you were talking about it. So, yeah. Um, but how does, how does one get to the point where they actually trust themselves or they trust their intuition or they trust that what they're receiving is the highest good or how do they get to the point where they can actually surrender because they've never done it before you know sometimes things have led down the wrong path or they've made bad decisions before um well well what I, what I yes I, I the question is multi i could i could you know the tendency is okay let me give you the five step hack right but the truth <laughs> is <laughs> the truth is there's no hat right mm -hmm. in terms of oh i trust my intuition and led me down the wrong path on one level it seemed to lead you down the wrong path but ultimately there's no wrong path it's just the ego sees it as a wrong path from a limited perspective. Mm. But often when you look back at your life and you will end up seeing, oh shit, that wrong path took me down the wrong street, which took me down. And then I met my husband or my wife. So had you not taken that wrong path, had you not screwed that situation up, had you not married that wrong person, had you not dated that wrong, then you would not have gone down a street and a trajectory to be even on the corner where the right thing was waiting for you. So ultimately, from the grand perspective, there is no wrong path. There's just the path that your soul is on for your own learning and journey. There's just growth. There's just evolution. In, in that greater sense, you can't really screw up your soul's plan. You're not that powerful. Your soul doesn't care about comfort and perfection. Your soul cares about evolution. Evolution. And so there is no wrong path. So long as you're learning, so long as you're growing and so long as you're evolving. Now, that doesn't mean you make the same mistake over and over and over and over again. It's like, oh, there's no wrong path. No, you make, you, you learn, you learn, and then you course correct, and you get more into alignment, you come more into alignment. And so in that sense, I don't see the path as right or wrong because we all have a different path. We all have a unique path and unique learnings. And to me, the key is, am I growing? Am I evolving? Am I becoming, more, am I learning the lessons? Am I becoming more of who I truly authentically am? Am I realizing more of my true essence, my own authenticity, my own true divinity? To me, this is this is this is the key. So in that conversation, let go of that because the wrong path and the right path can create such a analysis of paralysis for us. Oh shit. Mm. I don't wanna I, I, if I do this and then if I do that, then then I'm gonna be on the road. It's like then we end up sitting there doing nothing and then we don't evolve. And so all you can do, so, so let me back up. So that's that's step one. What I would say is in terms of, okay, trusting what, how to know what to do. The real answer is as you do, there's no shortcut. As you do your mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual, therapeutic inner work to heal your childhood, to heal your traumas to heal your incompletions you then clear yourself of the conditioned patterning that is stored in your physiology in your subconscious and in your nervous system the nervous system is the antenna to the world information comes in and through this decipher mechanism called the nervous system you are interpreting and processing life and i say that to say when your nervous system your body your mind your subconscious is clouded with unprocessed shit from your past, you won't be able to discern the deep truth in information and the guidance clearly. You, mm. We all receive guidance. We all get the guidance. But if you're clouded with hurt, pain, trauma, you know, emotional incompletion, guidance comes through and it will get filtered through the muddied, the muddied lens of your own sort of unprocessed stuff, right? And so the real work is to do the work to clear yourself, which takes time, so that you become clearer. And the clearer you become, the less baggage you're carrying, the less baggage you're, you're carrying, 
the more clearer you see, the more clearer you can perceive. So then when the innate intelligence and guidance comes through you, you will be able to perceive it more clearly and accurately without the the, the, the limited projections and distortions of your conditioning. Mm -hmm. Then you'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is not my soulmate. I, I, I kind of like thought it was my soulmate because it, it's like it felt familiar, but no, 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 no. I can see that this is not the right person for me, right? We're able to discern more clearly because there's less unresolved patterning inside of us. So that's the path, you know, that's the path of discernment. So with that said, often information comes through, information comes through, it emerges, it comes through, it comes through, it comes through. It comes through. The information Intuition arises from the unconditioned dimension of your being. Often, the information and guidance you're given doesn't make sense to your mind because it's not arising from your ego-conditioned mind. And so it's natural that when it comes through, it doesn't make sense to your mind. It's not meant to make sense to your mind because it doesn't fit your mind's preconceived limitation. And that's why when we're guided, like, turn left, do this, write that. It's like, well, wait a second. Then the danger is, because it doesn't fit our current limited ego's conditioned pattern, the ego kicks in and tries to, this is where we block ourselves. The ego kicks in and tries to make sense of the information. It's like, well, what does this mean? And how does this make sense? And then we start analyzing it because the ego wants to analyze the guidance that we're given to try to make sense of the guidance we're given because the ego thinks if I can understand it, then I can then I can be in control. If I'm in control, I won't get hurt. If I don't understand this information and I'm guided to go into the unknown, this is danger. And what we have to understand is the ego's job is to protect you from getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And the ego's job is to reinforce its existence. And so we kind of block our own flow and guidance by trying to understand everything. So I would say stop trying to understand the intuitive guidance you're given is bigger than your mind. So what does that mean? What I have learned, what I had to learn to do was I would feel feel an impulse. Sometimes the impulse comes through a sensation. Sometimes the impulse comes in a voice. Sometimes the impulse comes in a thought. Sometimes the impulse comes in a dream. Sometimes the impulse comes in a feeling, a temperature change, or just a subtle feeling of something feels a bit off. And it's so subtle that we don't pay attention. And we're like, no, I'm just crazy. Look, when you feel that, listen. So what I had to learn to do through getting my ass kicked by life enough times is when I feel a little turn left, I stopped questioning. Because often the intuitive nudging is not necessarily emotionally charged. It's just, it's a subtle, like, go in this direction. Call, mm -hmm. you know, call, call Aaron. And there's no, like, call it. It's just... Yeah. And you could almost miss it if you're not paying attention. Yeah. And then the man, why do I call Aaron? I haven't spoken to him. So here's what I had to learn. When I hear the guidance, feel the guidance, sense the guidance, in any shape or form, I just follow it. Turn left, turn left. You might ask me, Coot, why? I don't know. Go go right. Why? No idea. I, and, and so giving up the need to know frees you to be in the flow. And what you will find is, as you take a step, as you take a step, as you take a step, life reveals itself to you in the process of living. Then often in retrospect, you'll look back and go, oh, I, I, I see how all the dots connect now. Mm -hmm. And that's where the magic happens because you're not living and manifesting from your mind, which is limited. You're living in the flow and the stream of life. And so for me, then your intuition gets stronger because you're not blocking it every two seconds. You're just following it. And then it expands. And that's the magic of surrender. <clears throat> that's the magic, man. That's the magic. Shit has happened in my life, man, that I could not have freaking planned. Yeah. My intuition said, go to Brazil. What the hell go to Brazil? Just go. No, I was in Egypt. Just long story short, ended up meeting my wife in Brazil in the most random way. In the way I was like, I'm, I'm never going to meet a woman that way. I'm going to meet her this way. And there you go. But if I, if I didn't follow this feeling, it's like, wow, life would be so different. So okay. I want, I would just invite everyone. When you live in integrity with your soul, 
you will always end up in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people. You will be guided in ways that you cannot imagine. And you will always be the right person in the right place at the right time. The route that you take may not be the one that you most expect, but I promise you, magic will happen. And magic, when I say magic, magic is that which is beyond your mental capacity to imagine. And who doesn't want more magic? And when I ask people, who wants more magic? Who wants more magic? Magic is more joy, more abundance, more love. Everybody raises their hand, but nobody wants to surrender. Mm. And, 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 and the formula is like, I want more magic. Well, then, yeah, the formula is you got to surrender. And the degree of magic you will experience in your life is in direct proportion to the degree to which you surrender. So how much magic do you really want to experience? Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you, man. Thank you for your for your time, for your energy, for everything you put out into the world. Um, where should people go if they want more of you? Thank you. It's been a, it's been a fun interview, brother. A um, couple of things. I would say get the book, folks, The Magic of Surrender. It's uh, available on Amazon. Get the paperback version written simply with a lot of love and, and inspiration. Uh, that's the first thing. I wrote it so that even a, a 12-year-old could read the book. So hopefully you'll you'll be inspired by that. I would say this, you know, something I'm very passionate about is, is really transforming people's lives on a very deep level. This has been my, my life. This is how I built my career and reputation. Um, if someone's listening and you feel inspired by the conversation, you're feeling as though you, you've been put on the planet for a purpose bigger than yourself and you feel ready to heal, ready to transform, ready to connect to your authentic nature and power and share your gifts with the world twice a year. I do a very special event uh, in Bali. It's 12 days with me in Bali. Um, it's the deepest work I do, probably. It's called Boundless Bliss, the Bali Breakthrough Experience. Mm -hmm. The next event is July the 20th through the 31st. You can find out more information, www.boundlessblissbali.com. That's boundlessblissbali.com. Find out info there. You can apply at that website, uh, Instagram, Coot Blackson, uh, Facebook, Coot Love Now. Amazing. Thank you, Coot. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much for tuning into that episode. And if you enjoyed it, click right here, right here for another full length episode of the podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe. But most importantly, most importantly, above all else, please, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.